uh, if, if your business is the same as it was last year, then uh, you've got problems, uh, particularly given the way that the, the business environment changes, uh, regardless of whether there's a pandemic or not. I think we should all be trying to build a business which uh, ultimately, if you build a business which you were looking to sell, whether you sell it or not, uh, th- that's the, the best way to have something that you know, you, you can say, okay, well, that's my legacy. I've left something behind, whether it's to, to hand it down to your, uh, your children, uh, family members, et cetera, or you want to have a successful exit at the end of it. If you work on your business and position yourself around those nine pillars and also get yourself to a point where you're not actively involved in the business, you're reaping the rewards, but you're also, uh, it gives you more choice. And, and I'm all about having choices. Hello, and welcome to Uncovered the podcast with your host, Jason Irving. Join me in a journey to understand what's truly happening in your world and the world around you. This is not about how you're living life on the surface. It's about what's truly driving you from under the covers. I'm gonna take you on a journey to deeply uncover the reason why you are here. The ultimate purpose in your problems and the way that they have shaped your life up until now. See, I believe you have a purpose and your problems are the highway towards ultimate realization of that journey towards freedom and the reconnection of your true self. I've been told I have a different spin on most things and I'll be giving you my understanding of life, love and what we're all here for, purpose. To get the best out of this podcast, drop what you already know so you can discover what's beyond you. So join me, let's play this game of life and bring on liberation, transformation and change. Let's do this. Hey guys, welcome to Uncovered. I'm really excited. I've got uh, an amazing man who knows numbers and I've had quite a few people who are on our podcast that know numbers. I'm not the greatest at numbers. I'm really excited. I had a really, really crappy accountant. We're going to be talking accounting and and business and all of these sorts of things that are quite often the things that a lot of business owners are scared of and don't really know what to do. So they shove all of this stuff to the side because it's too hard. And it's, it, we put it in the too hard basket. So we, we try and find uh, people like yourself, Rakesh. So I'm really looking forward to ha- having a chat with you. Welcome to Uncovered. Thanks, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd love a little bit of a backstory. Where are you from? What got you into your business that you do today? What makes you tick? All right, sure. Uh... So I'll, I'll try not to give you the long version, but um, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. Uh, I came to Australia just to get away from the, the situation over there. Uh, you know, parents, uh, it was pretty much uh, growing up, seeing them, you know, not being able to provide and, and all of that. Uh, so came to Australia to study a Bachelor of Commerce, hoping to, you know, achieve a, a better future, uh, not, even, not even for myself, but also for for them as uh, my dependents. Um, came here and I, I mucked around for a bit while I was at uni, as, as you do when you're, you're young and naive and, and you think that, uh, you know, you'll be young forever. Uh-huh. Um, and I got to a point where, you know, I had dabbled in a few different uh, electives and, uh, you know, crunch time came and I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? Do I stay in Australia or do I move on? Uh, anyway, I decided to stay here uh, mainly because of the, the opportunities, you know, work, um, security from a, both an economy perspective, as well as uh, just your, your home safety. Um, when I left Zim, there, there were actually instances of people getting axed and you know, th- that's when uh, a lot of the indigenization was, was happening. Um, my, my family is still over there, so uh, it, it's not a bad place. It's just you know, the, the way that the media portrays it and what actually happens is uh at times chalk and cheese yeah so, can we have a little bit of a talk about that because i was in sri lanka um in 1997 and there was a there was a civil war between um in the country and what was being promoted in in the australian media was nothing like what was actually happening over there and it's very very frustrating to hear one of my neighbors was um um husband's an SAS officer and he was in East Timor and she would be in a panic looking at the media and he just said stop looking at the media it's not happening this is not what's going on and it's very very annoying hearing sort of information that's not true 
And so tell me about, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience of Zimbabwe. You know, there are hard things and good things. Tell us about um, your country of origin. All right, sure. Uh, because we, I come from a small mining slash agricultural based town. Uh, population is probably half a million people. Uh, and the town is, oh, it's really small. We, we've got one, or oh, probably now there's about three sets of traffic lights in, in town. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> uh, pretty much everyone's business is on the main street. There's about five streets in the actual city. And then uh, you, you go out and you know, it starts getting bigger as, as you move away from city center. Uh, growing up there was, wasn't too bad. Uh, outside of uh, my, my, I was actually back home visiting my folks recently. Um, and at times, because school fees couldn't get paid on time, we'd uh, occasionally be dr getting dropped off by the, the receptionist, as in the school receptionist uh, at home, because, you know, the, the excuse was non-payment of fees. Um, you know, <laughs> despite all of that, we, we, we all turned out okay. Um, but from a, a security perspective, uh, it depended on where you actually lived. So if you were in an area which was opposition predominant, uh, as in the main uh, Democratic Party over there, well, the, the main uh, political party is um, the, the ZANU-PF, and the opposition is the Movement for Democratic Change. Um, if you were a supporter of either or, uh, you know, and if you were in a predominantly uh, MDC location, uh, you'd get bullied by, you know, let's say you were a ZANU-PF supporter, you'd get bullied by MDC supporters in that area and vice versa for ZANU-PF. Um, they also had what was uh, being introduced, or it had been introduced a couple of years prior, but uh, the indigenization whereby uh, war veterans would be taking over or, or reclaiming land that was incorrectly taken from them. Um, and at times it was violence used and the, the land they were reclaiming was actually acquired in most cases the right way. So uh, someone had come in, they literally paid money for that land. And because they, they were running a successful uh, business, whether it be farming or um, you know, there were some stores that, that were eventually taken away. But if you were running a, a successful business, uh, it was something that the, the war veterans uh, would, would want to get in on. Uh, the sad thing about that is that they ended up fishing out all the rivers that you had on your farm and they ate the crops and they didn't do much with the land. So uh, even now, they, there's still a few farms that are just dead land. You know, yeah, they, wow. They, there's weeds and stuff. Like that. Um, the, a lot of the people that resisted, they ended up getting, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they had the worst of it. Uh, when it initially started, there was a lot of violence with people coming in and you know, if, if you're taking something that I worked hard to build, obviously I'm going to resist and you're going to be like, well, this is my, my, my land rightfully. Um, and that's when the violence started happening. Uh, in our area, there wasn't too much of that, but it was probably unsafe if you were young or uh, you couldn't fend for yourself and you were moving around after certain hours and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you might have ended up, uh, you know, getting uh, beaten up or uh, worse still, you know, put in a hospital or, or, or dead. Um, yeah, wow. And so th that kind of escalated and got to a point where, you know, most of the, the, the people that were uh, holding the economy down, like keeping the economy stable, had already moved out of the country. Um, at, at one stage, Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Africa. Like yeah, wow. provided uh, fruit and veg to uh, not only Africa, but also the rest of the world. And uh, a lot of the farmers that were there have moved to Zambia. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, there's a big population here in, um, in Australia, uh, and then they're spread out across all of the states. Uh, I, I hear that Perth has a pretty decent concentration of um, Aust uh, Zimbabweans, and um, I think there is a big population in Sydney as well. So long, long story short, uh, it, it was frightening hearing about these stories, but from a, a media perspective, where they'd show worst case. So you'd get, yeah. you know, 10 instances of violence and maybe uh, on, on a magnitude of one to 10, 10 being catastrophic and death and, and all of that, there'd probably be one which was maybe at a 10. Uh, and even then, they, the backstory wasn't told. So it was largely, um, way, you know, positioned against the, the government at the time. Um, uh, in saying that, 
where when you look at the war veterans and their age, uh, a lot of them wouldn't have even been around when the when when independence was was fought for, because um, they would have been teenagers, and you know we're talking about twenty years after independence. So, uh, you know, they they probably be children of war veterans and and the like, but um, yeah, it it really wasn't in my eyes. I, I don't think there was a the the fairest approach to. Uh, to, to move toward, you know, the whole indigenization thing. Um, we, we did have a, a bit of activity sort of uh, in the equivalent of the outback. So probably about 60 Ks out of town. Uh, my dad had uh, a business over there whereby they used to extract um, gold from, from ore. So what they do is they crush the ore, they'd extract the gold and then buy it from the, pretty much the, the miners in that area. Um, when when it came to election time, uh, you'd actually see the, the the main party like trucks that they'd be you know with, with their branding and what have you, and they'd pretty much be giving um, what's called mealy meal. Uh, it's it's similar to corn. It's maize, and you grind the maize down. And uh, um, I think I've seen it in stores here. It's called uh, polenta, but not oh, the yeah, yeah. Stuff, just the, I like uh, the equivalent of that. Uh, they make it more like uh, you know you can have it as uh, something to chase your your vegetables with uh, so uh, as a, a substitute for rice anyway uh, Rukesh, uh, that, Rukesh, yes i just want to mention something right here um sure. your attitude right your attitude around around this listeners i think it's really important to listen to this we're talking to a guy who's had uh, who talks about his country and the hardships but the attitude and this is what's really important because I've, I've met a lot of Australian people who feel entitled. They need, some, they need something from the government. They need this. And you've come from a country where it's, it's not been that easy and you have not had life that easy. And um, it's really cool to actually talk to, you know, we're going to be talking about accounting and that sort of stuff, but to actually know the person that is Rakesh and the attitude and the way that you think, like, I'm really inspired by you as a person already. We don't know each other very well. We just actually met a couple of days ago. And I just wanted to get you on the podcast because I had a just really good feel about you as a person. And it's so awesome to actually see a very successful man from a stricken upbringing, but not saying, oh, this all happened to me, so I can't get where I want to go. So I just want to know a little bit about your attitude, how you think, because you're not stuck in a, in a, in a can. Yeah, I understand a hundred percent. I suppose it comes down to, to the fact that uh, each of us is, is the master of our own destiny. Uh, so uh, you can, there's two ways you can approach life. Uh, my dad actually sent me something the other day, uh, a little bit vulgar, so I won't share too much of it. But it had two pictures, uh, and one of them had someone being um, like someone was holding up a trophy, and the other guy was sort of cheering for him. And the other one had the other guy winning the trophy, and uh, the guy that initially pretty much the, the picture was the total opposite. Uh, the guy mm-hmm. wasn't supporting him, he was like, Oh, you know, he, he had a frown on his face and all. Um, what well, why should we? go through life um, standing over people in order to get ahead. Um, I think a better approach is if we lift each other up. And um, I think that's that's the way I approach everything. Mm. Uh, Things don't happen to me. I put myself in situations where, uh, are we allowed to curse on the (laughs) podcast? It's it's good. (laughs) So uh, I I put myself in, in situations where I tend to fuck up. Um, you know, uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to say that I'm, you know, someone who doesn't make mistakes or anything like that, but uh, maybe where I am today uh, and quite in modesty, but I, I don't think success has been achieved just yet. Uh, I've, I've gone through stages in life where, uh, you know, I, I'd always blame someone else and think, oh, this happened because of my upbringing. Mm. And uh, there's always someone in a, a worse situation than you. Yeah. So if you look at life and you're like, oh, you know, I, I, um, I, yeah, I came from Zimbabwe and things were bad and, you know, everyone's suffering and we, we still have a roof over our heads. I, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I, I managed to get out. 
and uh, it, you know there there were trials and tribulations along the way, but ultimately I I'm doing uh, better in in comparison to a lot of the people that that I grew up with. Uh, some some people had opportunity and they they wasted the opportunity, but maybe it's it's uh, uh, credit to my parents the the fact that they they taught us good values, and um, yeah, that, that's. That's ultimately what what defines you as a, a person. Yeah. Isn't it? Your, yeah. Your, well, it uh, does. It, it, it comes down to again, like you could have be given good values and end up a dipshit. Like um, you exactly. you you have the attitude. And listeners, this is really really important. Like what I look for when I'm looking for someone to give me a hand is I'm looking for first and foremost a good person, and second, good at what you do. Right. So let's let's go into that. Let's dive into you know what you do. Um, let's have a have a chat about um, you know revenue versus profit. For all the people who don't really know business, like this is really hard for people to digest. Um, I've just done some things with profit first, so I'm sort of learning the the ropes over the last couple of years around a different strategy around looking at at money. So tell us about what this means when, as an accountant or what you do to help businesses create a, a journey for their business to actually be profitable? Sure. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, follow a lot of his, his theories and I don't support a lot of what he includes in his book, but Robert Kiyosaki has a book out called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh-huh. Uh, and in that, uh, in that book, he's got what's called the, um, I think it's a, He's got a, a quadrant where he's got uh, employee, self-employed, business owner, and then uh, passive investment. Uh, what we mostly do as, as people who then go into business is we start off as an employee. So in the E quadrant, uh, we then move up into starting a business and we're like, oh, woohoo, uh, we're, we're getting people paying us for, for yeah. a service. And it feels good. You know, you're, yeah, it does. Uh, you're sticking it to the man because you've gone out and you're doing things on your own because you could do it better and you saw how your employer did it. Uh, The problem is that that's not a business owner because that's still you exchanging time for money. Uh, We've all got to get out of that mindset that the business relies on me. And in order to do that, you need to make yourself redundant from the business. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't mean physically fire yourself, well, maybe physically fire yourself, but you still need to be rewarded for driving the strategic direction of the business. Uh, At that point, you've pretty much replaced yourself by putting people, key people in your business who can run the, the day-to-day operations and you don't necessarily need to be there on an ongoing basis. That means you're now a business. Uh, you still are required for strategic direction and you know that, that's now for, for, in my eyes, that's, that's a business. Uh, it's got systems and processes, you've got people and partnerships and everything is moving like a well-oiled machine. Yeah. Then you move into what's called the passive investment quadrant. And that's where you're now completely out of the business. You're just a shareholder uh, or some sort of stakeholder and you're, you're able to generate or derive some sort of passive income from, from the business. Uh, I know you asked me the question, revenue versus profit. Oh, we're coming back to that. I love this. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just chewing down on what you're bringing down okay. to the table right now. I love it. All right, cool. Uh, so the idea behind what, what we all do on a day-to-day basis as business owners is that we're chasing some sort of a freedom. Uh, That could be time freedom, it could be peace of mind, uh, and most of the time it it could be uh, financial freedom. Or maybe it's a combination of all of them, maybe it's all of them, maybe it could be one or the other. Uh, Ideally, when we start in in a business, we're we're chasing every second, you know, pretty much everyone that comes to our door, we're like, yep, you're a client, you're a client, you're a client, you're a client or a customer. And we just want that cash to come in because it makes our numbers look pretty. (laughs) but if you're generating, uh, let's say you're, you're making a million dollars and the costs that you're incurring to generate that million dollars are 999000 you're not making much of a profit. The no. profit is what comes back to you as a business owner. Um, and, and a lot of, the, I suppose your, your financials tell you a story. If you've got crappy data going into your system, uh, your, your accounting system, uh, you're going to get crappy data out of it and you can't make uh, the, the right decisions. So uh, most people, uh, particularly in the startup space uh, with entrepreneurs, they're like, oh, you know, my revenue is X, Y, Z, and they're chasing that top number. But that doesn't mean that you're able to fund 
that lifestyle and the, the transition between the different stages of that uh, business owner's life, life cycle. Yeah. Uh, the idea is to, to maximize profit and don't be afraid of taxes. Uh, if you're paying tax, it means you're actually making money. And if you don't have the cash, it means you don't have a system behind that in order to, to funnel that, that cash that you're making into the appropriate wealth generating uh, channels. Uh, and uh, you're aware of uh, the work that Aureus does, but they pretty much uh, are an example of someone that can help you use that, use your money to make more money. Uh, I think I'll get, I might get the, the quote wrong, but it was uh, probably Benjamin Franklin that said this. He said, make money so that your money makes money that makes money. Uh, so mm -hmm. you're, you're only one part of the equation. And a lot of us as entrepreneurs or business owners tend to think it's all on us and we've got to do this. And um, I, I learned the hard way. Uh, for, for years, I, I thought I had a plan in my head and I'm like, oh, I'm working my plan, I'm working my plan. But if you don't have it written down, uh, you know, it's like looking at a compass. You could be one degree off and travel 5Ks. You don't get too far off your, where you're, you're headed. But yeah. in a, a year's time, even that one degree off from your plan uh, will, will end you up in a completely different location. So when you're looking at your numbers, if you're focusing on the revenue, you're, you're not feeding down into your profit. And generally, your, your profit is where, uh, that, that's what you ultimately are able to build your, it's called empire with. Uh, revenue doesn't really belong to you because from there, you know, you've got to account for your employee wages, your suppliers, uh, you've got to pay your taxes and your GST and all of that. So from a, a numbers perspective, I think your revenue is important, but you've got to dig down into the, the unit economics of that. So how many, um, if you earn a dollar in revenue, how much is it actually costing you to generate that dollar? And if you're working off a percentage system, generally you should be aiming between 50 and 25% net profit. Uh, if it's higher then uh, kudos to you, but that's, that's the, the range that most businesses would be looking to try and achieve. If you aren't, then you probably need to adjust your, uh, your costs because your, it's costing you too much to generate that revenue. Yeah. Um, let, let me put it, put it a different way. Excuse me. Uh, let, let's say you had a business, uh, two businesses, exactly the same. One of them is, they, they're absolutely flogging it. They, they, they're doing $10 million in revenue, but to generate that revenue, it's costing them nine and a half million. Then you have another business owner who's only doing $2 million uh, in, in revenue, but it's only costing them half a million dollars to generate that and they're able to, to walk away with one and a half million dollars. Yeah. Uh, exactly the same business, just the, the different sizes and growth for the sake of growth might look good to external shareholders and all, but uh, I suppose the, the question everyone really should come back and ask themselves is what does success look like to me? Because, uh, yeah. you know, Jason, between you and I, uh, success may look completely different. Um, yeah. You know, what you define as success and what I define as success would be, you know, completely different checks. How do you uh, find, how do you define success for a cash? Like what, what is it that, that, that uh, you feel successful? I, I might be bootlegging someone else's quote here, but uh, it, it was nice. So I figured I'll, I'll take it. But I think success is having, uh, having enough money to do whatever you want, but not everything. Uh, so, because when you have too much money, you, you tend to run into problems because you <laughs> you pick up uh, bad habits, you know, drugs and alcohol and what have you. But um, yeah, I think being able to to go through life not having to worry about uh, finance finances, uh, being able to spend time with your your loved ones. Uh, I just came back from a holiday back home in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, if I could go go back more often. Uh, you know, that would be me ticking a box in terms of. Ah, yeah, that's done fantastic. It. Uh, for being able to provide for for family and, and loved ones, I think that's that's also something that that's always bearing on my mind. So, uh, if if I can tick that box and say, well, I've got the, I suppose it, it stems from the finances, right? You you've got the financial freedom, which allows you to to then go on and and do all of these things, which uh, make you happy as a you know what drives you internally. Mm -hmm. And then being able to sleep at night, uh, I don't owe this person money, I don't owe the tax office money, yeah. uh, I don't have these issues, uh, like being I suppose success then becomes having that, that freedom to say, I've got nothing to worry about because everything's taken care of. Um, I love that. Obviously. I, I think that's really important, Prakash. I, I remember when um, I was in the public service, I was at, working for the ATO as a contractor in the IT industry. 
years and years ago. I had this, and I wanted to be a healer. And I had a very different philosophy, um, which I'm changing now. Um, a guy came up to me, his name is David, and he said, what the heck are you doing? You're going to go to a job. You, you don't know whether you're going to earn enough money. You don't know whether anything's going to work. And you're earning bucket loads of money right now. Um, and you're going to be throwing all of that away. And I looked at me in the eye and I said, I just want to be happy. Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's my currency. And I like making other people happy. Right. So my family are really, really important. And Anya's got some really, <coughs> really loves material wants which is really good for me because it helps me expose the business. So my business is defined by helping people break through and being happy mm -hmm. with whatever it is that they're wanting to achieve, whether it's money, whether it's a partner, you know, whether it's having that right house and happiness is intangible. And how do we create that? And I think money is a very, very important aspect to that. And I don't think people realize how important financial freedom can actually bring a sense of um, comfort and assurance and bring happiness. So people, quite often people who are poor say, I just want to be happy. And then you say, hey, what do you want? And they say, well, I can't afford that. And I was like, well, yeah. is that really happy or is that a lack of responsibility? It's, it's always, uh, uh, they tend to, people tend to take the, um, uh, it's it's an approach from a, a mindset perspective rather than adopting a growth mindset they they take this fixed mindset where they're like i'm governed by these restrictions yes and you know what fuck restrictions <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love it if you if you aim for uh, for the stars you're going to hit the tree tops uh, you know if you miss what's the worst case you hit the tree tops right and the tree tops are still a lot better than where you are now which is on the ground so um i suppose uh, my, my my attitude toward uh like when people tend to discredit themselves or, or use those sort of negative blockers and say, oh, you know, uh, it's because of this or oh, I, I can't afford something. Uh, wh what's stopping you from putting yourself in a position where you are able to? And it may even be that you have to take a few steps back in order to move forward. Uh, I spoke to a guy yesterday, one of my clients, and he he's actually considering closing the, the business down. And I was like, mate, you, you just need to stick to, to the business. And the, the, the question I asked him wasn't driven by numbers or anything. It was more around uh, how much time are you actually taking out for yourself? Mm. Uh, you, you've got to reward yourself, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean financially. Uh, you've got to take some time out of your, your business in order to be able to, to work on it or just you know, time away to, to clear your head, even if it means going out with the family, uh, going for a day trip on your own, whatever floats your boat, right? Because uh, that allows you to sort of disconnect you you then can reset and then come back with a, a fresh approach to everything. So hopefully he tries that because his business definitely is something that's that's worth um, nurturing. Right? But um, yeah, I suppose it, it comes down to to those regular catch ups and having someone to talk to. Because uh, yeah. uh, you, you probably already know this, but uh, entrepreneurship is generally a, a lonely journey. Yeah, it is. Um, um, I'm very lucky because I have my wife and you know I've got. Um, you know, people working for me, so it's easier. And the way what I've set up is a community of autonomy. So a lot of the time in entrepreneurship, people are putting on a face to show that they've got it all covered mm -hmm. and everything is fine. Whereas I don't do that. If I'm having a hard day, the academy members know what's going on for me because I believe that transparent leadership is really, really important. Oh, so, 100%. Um, a lot of people don't, entrepreneurs don't have that bone in them. And I've spent a lot of time with big wigs and they've said, I can't let anyone know what's going on. So they tell me behind closed doors, they're stressed, they're in tears, nothing's working and they're making all this money and they're showing all this stuff on Facebook that they are when really behind the scenes, they're actually a crumpled mess. And this is systemic in, especially right now since COVID, I think COVID's really put a, a mental squeeze on people. Mm, definitely. But, but I, what I have noticed is a lot of people uh, being more real. So, you know, the, yesterday I spoke to a software provider and he, he was doing, he was working from home. Uh, you can see the background and all, and I'm like, oh, mate, you, you actually beat me to it because I had to blur my background as well. Uh, 
the the home office looks nothing like the, the office here in uh, in the city. Um, and, and I think it's it's now acceptable to to see that sort of thing. Like, oh, okay, you're working from home. Uh, you expect to see children running in and, and that kind of thing. Hmm. Which I think as as a, a business community, we and this is this community is maybe worldwide because regardless of location, you see the same sort of thing happen. Yeah. Uh, people have lowered their standards, but it also means that we can have more frank discussions and talk about things which probably were taboo back in the day. Uh, you know, you, you can't go there. And um, it, it makes the, the conversations more personal, even though you're not there face to face with someone having a conversation. Okay. So uh, j- just my, my, uh, my feeling, because mo- most of our clients are interstate anyway. Yeah. So uh, Zoom and, and Teams are how we interact uh, a lot of the time. And some people we've, we've never met like face to face. That's fantastic. It's, it's nice how this has happened. Like <laughs> I've changed, um, I changed accountants. I had a really terrible one and he was a person who would just, um, he was the once a, once a time, once a year accountant where you go and see him and you hand your stuff over. He would try and fig- figure out how to minimize your tax and then that would be it. And I had no idea um, that that was anything, uh, there was anything other than that. Um, it's like, and I was told, you know, that's the old school accountant model where um, the accountants don't really give a crap. They're, they're just using, you know, getting your numbers, doing what they do. I never really felt like I was getting the support I needed, but I didn't know there was anything else. So what is it that you do that's that's different to that? And also, you know, how do you switch from, a lot of people look at accountants like a hairdresser. You don't know whether you, you don't know what to do. You think you're hamstrung by that accountant because they've got your deets. And um, so what does this all look like if you want to change, change something? Uh, if you're looking at, at switching accountants, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward process. Uh, generally, you, you look at making sure you, you've paid up all of their bills and what have you. Uh, and then you're, once you approach your, your new accountant, uh, they send what's called uh, an ethical request across to the existing accountant. Uh, pretty much that asks for, you know, is there any reason why we shouldn't accept this engagement? Uh, and then they're requesting, well, as part of the ethical request, you're requesting a lot of your, what's called permanent documents. Uh, permanent documents could be things like trust deeds, uh, like your, your personal file. Um, if you've got any loan contracts and that sort of thing that span over a number of years, which will be relevant for the current year. Uh, all of that gets requested and then it gets transferred across from your existing account. So you as the, the client uh, have very little to do with in, in that process. Okay. Uh, you then provide your incumbent accountant as the new accountant with, oh, this is how we do it anyway, but uh, we then ask for uh, like your personal details. So tax plan numbers, date of birth. Uh, we then do, it's, it's a little bit more of a, a comprehensive form where we're asking more around, uh, you know, things like, Who's your lawyer? Your insurance policies, uh, you know th- those kind of things. Because when when we we take a bit more of a, a holistic approach to your life, while we are your accountant, we also want to still be your trusted advisor. Uh, and working with other professionals is, I think, the way that we we flourish uh, in, in carrying on business ourselves. Because we we don't do financial planning, we don't do mortgage broking, but we do know people that that are experts in in those areas. Um, whereas we, we just stick to our, we do the books, we do the tax, we do tax planning, and we do the business advisory. So uh, a typical engagement with us is, as I mentioned, a holistic approach. So we will manage the bookkeeping. We then do the, so bookkeeping is us allowing or rather controlling the data going into your accounting system. Uh, we then prepare your BAS and tax and com- generally that's called your compliance. So we handle the compliance work basically keeping you out of jail and ticking off on all the red flags that the ATO raises. Uh, and then on the back of that, we do what's called um, management reporting. So as opposed to looking at your numbers, you know, four times a year or once a year, uh, you're then forced to look at them on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, that monthly report then gives you a comparison. So you're looking at a report that's structured that highlights how much revenue you made. What's the, you know, what are the costs associated with that revenue? And what are your overheads? And then it gives you your gross profit, your net profit. Uh, it, it allows you as a business owner to actually check, okay, well, are we actually moving ahead or are we moving backward? If you're reviewing that on a monthly basis, it can, you can pick up things that uh, pre-COVID, uh, I heard a heap of stories about people that had been paying for subscriptions 
or licenses which they either weren't using or weren't relevant to where their business was at that point, point in time. Then COVID hit and people started doing the review. Why does it take a pandemic to review your numbers and isolate things that you aren't, uh, that aren't relevant or, or making a difference in your business uh, for you to then decide, okay, we're going to can this, we're going to can that. So uh, th that approach is pretty much looking at any variances in what we've already budgeted for that 12 month period. If there's any outliers, we, we try and get the, our, our clients to explain those. If they can't explain, then we dig deeper and find out exactly why there's a variance. Sometimes it might have been uh, a subscription that was incorrectly charged, or uh, you know now there's cybersecurity breaches. So you might have paid. We actually had a, a client who paid. You no, know, their details were their client's system was compromised. Someone emailed their client saying, uh, "We're from XYZ Provider Limited. Can you please change the the bank details that you use to make payments to us?" Uh, there was an in invoice. I think it was about eighty grand that they paid across. This is a completely different entity. And so, you know, there's insurance that covers those sort of things. But once you make a claim from insurance, it, it then puts you in, in their bad books and getting a renewal the year after affects your premiums and, and that sort of thing. So what I'm trying to say is when you look at things from a holistic point of view and you're not just ticking boxes and flicking pages and saying, okay, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Uh, you're looking at the numbers, both your profit and loss and your balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet is actually more important than people uh, tend to think. Uh, your balance sheet is what drives the rest of your financial statements. Mm. Because everything that happens from an asset and liability perspective are on your balance sheet, that feeds into your profit and loss, and ultimately that determines your cash flow. Uh, a lot of people tend to just focus on balance sheet. And like, You're telling me I've made this much money and I don't have any of this cash in my bank account. Uh, mm. So then you go into the discussion and explaining the difference between cash and accrual. Yeah. Um, sure. So, so yeah. Rakesh, you've got uh, a nine-pillared approach to financial management. What does that mean for a, for a person who has absolutely no clue about um, these sorts of things? What What does that actually mean, and, and what's it look like? All right. So the, we 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 look at. I mentioned before the the holistic approach that we take to working with our clients. And pretty much this, this involves us looking at things like your, your business's governance uh, and your governance is really uh, things that, that help you make your, uh, I suppose in a nutshell, it's thinking people like us do things like this. This is your, your systems, processes, procedures, like, like what I mentioned before, whereby that will allow you to get to a point where you're now running a business. Uh, and you're ticking off on all of the boxes to say, if anyone in our organization picks up um, a particular, you know, they've, give, they've been assigned a task, they, they'll all conduct that on a, a uniform basis. So uh, it's, it's pretty much your systems and procedures uh, from a, a documentation perspective. Uh, then we're looking at the things like your, your product or your, your service. So what's your value proposition? Do you have a customer persona around that value proposition? And this ties into your actual unit economics, which feed into your sales and ultimately will determine your margins that you make on those sales. Uh, then you're looking at things like your, your people and partnerships. So what are the key functions and activities that you, you carry out on a day-to-day -day basis in your business? Uh, how do those work with external partnerships and, and people? So if you've got other advisors who provide things like, um, in my example, uh, things like financial planning, mortgage broking, uh, if someone's from a legal background, they, they're able to then uh, provide that, that strategic alliance, which helps us deliver the best possible outcome for, for our clients uh, without compromising on the quality. Imagine if I had to pick up uh, you know, some legal uh, case study and, and try and use that to provide an, uh, an outcome for our clients, uh, they, they probably wouldn't get the best because uh, I don't think I have a legal bone in my body. Um, we then look at things like uh, marketing, which is the, the fourth one. Uh, and then you've got your, your key channels. You know, is it direct marketing, indirect? Um, do, do you partner with someone to provide the marketing? Or is it done internally by the client? Uh, and then, you're, again, throughout the, the, this whole process, you're looking at the unit economics. So for every dollar spent on marketing, what's the expected return on that? And what's the timeline for us to get a return on that dollar spent? Uh, some people tend to throw money at a, an ad campaign. Uh, they don't really put too much thought into the, the background and developing something that ties into their brand, their value proposition, 
and pretty much their purpose for, for having that business. Uh, and then they wonder why the marketing isn't yielding results. Uh, and generally that, that's, you know, it's a two to three month process where you expect to, to start seeing results. It's not something instantaneous where you throw money at an ad campaign and expect to get sales, uh, which leads into our next uh, pillar, which is sales. So this is, uh, you know, are you selling your, your services? What services are you selling? Uh, how do you go about selling that? Are you actually collecting feedback through using net promoter scores, uh, getting actual feedback from your customers, things like testimonials, uh, things that will actually drive your revenue. And again, unit economics, how many sales of X service or X product are we gonna to have to make in order to hit our targets at a revenue level so that we can then reach certain uh, gross profit and net profit margins. Uh, again, that, that ultimately depends on, uh, it varies across the different businesses, but if you're wanting to pay yourself more money, you can't just do it automatically. You need to determine how many sales you've actually got to make um, you know, for whether that be recurring sales or uh, one-off sales in order to fund the revenue, to provide the revenue, which will then fund uh, a pay increase for you as the owner of the business and potentially bringing on additional team members, whether that be uh, at a higher managerial level or even if it's just uh, at that sort of entry level where you're getting someone to do the work so that you can promote other people through, through the business. Uh, the other thing, sixth one is looking at uh, your revenue streams. Um, and pretty much that's, that's your, your reporting, which uh, you would think as an accountant reporting is the first thing that we do. But you know, you're looking at revenue streams, how many streams of revenue do you have? Do you have affiliates that provide you with uh, some sort of uh, referral fees if you uh, refer clients across? Um, you know, what, what cost structures are you working with? Uh, is, are those cost structures fixed? Do they vary? Uh, do you have predominantly offshore team? Is it locally based? And then you're looking at things like uh, your non-financial uh, drivers of profit. So things like uh, COVID, uh, that would have been a non, non-financial driver of activity because on the back of that, you know, the, the pandemic, uh, a lot of businesses were forced to either close or stop trading for at least a, a certain period. Um, so th- that's all part of the, the reporting pillar. Then we have your business process pillar, which is pretty much uh, you're documenting and communicating the, the key activities to people internally. So that ties in with your governance and compliance. Um, and then you're looking at things like, are we actually delivering a consistent customer experience? And if your business processes are uniform across the board, everyone does the same thing, regardless of who your customers speak to on a day-to-day basis, they'll receive the same level of experience uh, from a customer perspective. Um, I don't know if you've done any of uh, those whole, you know, the, the call, se- call center calls recently where if you call, say, for example, Telstra or Vodafone, um, you could speak to three different people and you might have a pleasant experience at the start of it. And by the time you get to the, the third person, you're like, well, that, uh, uh, that, that dropped really quickly. Um, it could work the other way around where, you know, as you're getting passed along, the, your experience gets better. It should be a uniform uh, customer experience in, in my eyes. And, and pretty much that's, that's what we're helping our, our clients to, to achieve. Obviously that's not our forte, but we'll work with them to try and determine who's the best uh, partner or who are the, the best type of people to, to assist with that process. Uh, and then we have uh, the eighth one, which is your pretty much your, your IT. Uh, nowadays, we, we ourselves are a cloud-based firm. So uh, if I have a, a laptop, and internet connection, that's pretty much my, my office. Um, a lot of the time, mo- most other businesses are driven by some sort of uh, technology in the back end, whether it be an app or uh, you know, some sort of framework that governs you know, how they conduct business with the outside world. That gives them the efficiencies in their business processes. Uh, then you're looking at things like your, your people, how do they play a part in the functionality of your, your internal IT, your processes, and then also the systems around how you use IT as a business. And lastly, we're looking at things like your, your actual vision and values. Uh, are there any key trends? Uh, what's the strategic development? Uh, and then are you actually executing on your business strategy? Like those things are elements of a, uh, a business which tend to, to go unattended to. Uh, you might even be just focused on the numbers with your, your accountant. But 
all of those other aspects should be considered in discussions because if you're looking at your business holistically, you should be able to iron out exactly where there's a squeaky wheel and before it actually becomes uh, something that, that's a really bad problem. So from a, you know, even the people and partnerships perspective, uh, if you've got a, a bad team member, common example is, you know, the one, all it takes is one apple to spoil the barrel, right? Yeah. So if you can identify that sooner, uh, rather than waiting 12 months and then having a chat with the accountant saying, uh, they, they'll ask, oh, what happened over here? And you're like, well, well we had uh, a number of employees come in and then exit the business. So our employee turnover was high. The, the question then would be, well, what drove that turnover? Because historically, you haven't had that sort of turnover. And th- that's pretty much how uh, we try and approach all our client interactions. Like some of those don't become uh, very important. It just depends on where the business is at that particular point in time. But at, at least if you're addressing them on an ongoing basis, it gives you an idea of how you're tracking against projections and goals that you set for yourself. Rakesh. Yes. Rakesh, sorry. You, uh, you are not an accountant in my opinion. Right? <laughs> like the amount of um, information that you just shared just then shows a really different attitude and a very, very different way of approaching um, numbers. Like I've heard, I've never heard something like this come out of an accountant's mouth. So all I'm hearing is a trusted business advisor. That's what I'm hearing. And I think um, a lot of the time we just expect someone just to do one thing, just get our tax done. That's, that's all we think. Right? <laughs> and so you're, you're sharing um, a new model, I think, for accounting that actually needs to be shared. Because if, if we don't get this, this sort of advice um, and this sort of, ability from our accountant we probably need to have a think about trying to get your services because uh i've never i've not heard this sort of information um the amount that you that you deliver and what you want to share with your clients just to make sure they stay on track because this is not just about numbers this is about making ensure ensuring the business is not just going to stay afloat it's going to be um working in a way that's not only going to make good profit it's and and see where the squeaky le- leaks are is how to fundamentally improve the business. Would you agree? Hundred uh, percent. If if your business is the same as it was last year, then uh, you've got problems. Uh, particularly given the way that the, the business environment changes, uh, regardless of whether there's a pandemic or not. I think we should all be trying to build a business which, uh, ultimately, if you build a business which you were looking to sell, whether you sell it or not. Uh, th- that's the, the best way to have something that, you know, you, you can say, okay, well, that's my legacy. I've left something behind, whether it's to, to hand it down to your, uh, your children, uh, family members, et cetera, or you want to have a successful exit at the end of it. If you work on your business and position yourself around those nine pillars and also get yourself to a point where you're not actively involved in the business, you're reaping the rewards, but you're also, uh, it gives you more choice. And I'm all about having choices because things change, you know, regardless of where you are in life, uh, you might have a plan uh, when you're younger and that might change because maybe you started a family early, late, it depends, right? Uh, and th- that's just it about a plan. It's, it's something that you, you use to, to guide your decision-making and how you actually go about doing things, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a fixed plan. Like your 12 month plan could feed into a, a greater 10 year plan, which maybe your 10 year plan was done 15, 20 years ago. So uh, the, the idea behind that is when you're doing your planning session is to constantly re- reflect on the overall big picture mm-hmm. and think, okay, well, how does all this tie into where we are now, where we want to be? And do our long-term goals tie in with what, we, what they were when we set them you know, all those years ago? So yeah, it's, um, I suppose it, it's more of a, like, like I said, a, a holistic approach and we, we don't want to be thought of as typical tax and uh, bookkeeping accountants. Uh, the, in, in an ideal client's perspective, I think uh, uh, success would be if uh, someone asked us, oh, you do tax as well? Uh, you know, if we, after we I talk about the other stuff we do, 
uh, that, that's I think the best way to differentiate our services to uh, what's on the market there. Um, and we, we kind of just have a core package which will keep you sort of that, that whole keep you out of jail thing, tick all of the boxes if you're really looking to just get that kind of service. And a lot of what I've, I've gone through, um, I, I've heard that business coaches do that as well. Uh, we, we have no problem working with clients that have business coaches. A lot of our clients do already have uh, a business coach. Uh, our job is to work with the business coach so that clients will always get the best outcome, regardless of what services we're providing them. Mm. Uh, the goal is for them to be moving forward, not thinking about, oh, we've got to cut these costs and we, we're retracting the business. Uh, maybe that, that's part of the goal, but ideally, I think we, we have to focus on maximizing that bottom line because uh, like I said before, that feeds into your, your big wealth picture and you know, it generates yeah. that, uh, gets you closer to the freedom. Well, Rakesh, I think one of the things that people are missing here is what you just said is that I never, until I started uh, getting an idea of what was possible, I was very naive um, in the way that I was running my business. I feel like um, I feel like I was running a very shonky business when I was um, and still feel that way on some levels with um, the improvements that I want to make in my business. Um and people don't actually have a wealth plan. People, people and, that, and that's how it is. Like people have no plan. They go, I just like doing what I do. And they have no future focus, a lot of them. And I would say 90% of, 90, 95% of businesses have no idea what you've just spoken about and have not thought about it this way because they're still focusing on being the central uh, figurehead of the business and they're, they're trying to get through and making sure that they can get their business working. And a lot of people um, can't, like I can't at the moment, um, in all honesty, I can't leave my business without it falling apart. And um, I'm working on exactly what you said. I love what you said because I want to be able to create a sellable business, which means that I can't be the linchpin of it. And a lot of people don't think this way. Then when something like COVID happens, then a lot of businesses fell apart because you're not prepared for something so so crazy like an experience that we've had that has never happened on the planet before where they've constrained everything and businesses um, went down the down the strainer down the toilet and some and some actually did really well i my business improved through covid because i adapted very very quickly um, so can, can you give the listeners a little bit um, of an idea about, you know, thinking about what a wealth plan looks like and like how you can come in and slide into a picture where someone doesn't really think this way. They're thinking about, you know, their clients that they help and trying to make sure they stay afloat. And that's usually what business owners <laughs> um, are doing. Exactly. So uh, a lot of us tend to have, uh, I'll, I'll use myself as an example before I started working with uh, a wealth advisor. But uh, I had this picture in my head that, you know, by a certain age, I want to be able to have, uh, you know, own a property and I just want to be swimming in cash. Um, and, and there was no real structure around that. Uh, they, they, there were goals that came up and fell off because obviously they weren't written down. But the idea behind having a, a wealth plan is, you're literally documenting everything up to 20 years out uh, in yeah. terms of where your mind is at right now. And you pretty much got 20 year goals and you got 15, 10, five, and then you got your, your 12 and 12 months and three year goals because uh, you know, anything can happen in 12 months and that could then change the trajectory of your, your longer term goals. So the idea behind uh, ha having a wealth plan is it sets some sort of structure for you to work on, on a, to work toward over a short, shorter period. So for example, uh, we want to be able to achieve, uh, you know, we, we, want, we want to be able to buy our first uh, investment property in 12 months time. And as a business owner, how do we actually do that? We can't necessarily pay ourselves more money. Uh, we could, but there are other ways that you, you could get around that. And you also need to think about the tax implications of those decisions. You pay yourself more money, you're pushing yourself into a higher tax bracket. Uh, you could pay yourself, uh, depending on how you, your shareholding in the business or your ownership is structured, you could pay yourself a, a dividend. Maybe you pay dividend to an entity that you are a stakeholder in. 
uh, whether it be shareholder or director, uh, and that entity makes the purchase. So when you're uh, with the wealth plan, thinking about how do we actually hit those numbers, it all starts with you looking at, okay, where's our spending habits? What do we need to tidy up? And pretty much, you know, if, if I'm explaining this correctly, it'll come out uh, exactly as, as I hope, otherwise uh, I'm just rambling. But you need to, to be on top of your numbers in your business and in your, your personal savings and earnings in order to fund the, the wealth plan that you, you will have put together. If you, if you don't start with the income earning expense paying section of your, your life, the, the wealth section will tend to, to come as, you know, it's an afterthought. Mm. And then what happens when you get to retirement age and you've just got super to, to rely on and then you're like, oh, you know what? I'm, I have a client who is actually, uh, like he gets um, income from, from the government. So welfare payments and what have you. Uh, it's not a lot, trust me. I think he gets $190 a fortnight. Mm. And that's because they left it way too long before they started thinking about wealth generation and having that something to fall back on. Uh, if you live a certain lifestyle, you still want to be able to, to live that lifestyle into and well beyond retirement. Uh, and the only way you can do that is work toward another. Uh, a wealth advisor will be able to get the number exactly to, to a T and say, okay, well, what, what does it mean for you in terms of in retirement? How much do you actually want to earn? So they, they look at the unit economics behind that, get uh, a big picture dollar value, and then you work toward hitting that dollar value because once you get to retirement, you start drawing on that. And uh, to fund what you're doing at retirement, it all depends on what you're doing from a, an accounting and tax perspective and how you're structured and whether that's going to benefit you or it's going to cost you from a tax perspective or uh, you know, if, if you make the, the wrong decisions, you might dig a hole for yourself and ha have to hit up the government for while it is free money, it's, it's not a lot. So <laughs> no, that's right. And look, listeners, I think this is really, really important. Um, we're going to wrap this up. Um, I would love one golden nugget from you, Rakesh. Like I, I from having a chat to you, uh, I think a Rakesh in your corner is essential for your business especially if you're in that strainer like you said where you you know you you you're getting through your day or you're getting through your week and you're stressed because you don't know what your future is going to look like and that's a bleak very stressful life so give us one 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 puzzle piece that you can just say what can we do um if we're a business owner um or we're you know in a job um, trying to make sure that we've got a good income at, at the back end of our life. What's one thing that you suggest that we need to think about now? Uh, uh, it's probably a, a no-brainer, but uh, spend less than you earn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, a lot of us, we, right now we're, we're in a consumerist uh, society where everyone wants everything, fashion trends and what have you. But, you know, th those are things that, that change every year. Uh, your your wealth generation and what you're doing in terms of, you know, are, are you actually doing for your family? Like it, it comes back to, to, to what drives your purpose. Tie the, what I just said about spending less than you earn to your purpose and any excess can then feed your purpose into the future. I love it. Well, listeners, I'd love uh, the opportunity for you. If you really like this, especially if you're a business owner and you're, um, you've heard a lot of amazing information today and uh, you want some help from Rakesh, we'll put all of his details in the show notes so you can uh, get a hold of him. I'd love it if you could like uh, and share this particular podcast, especially for business owners who are in that struggle street and they need help because people like you, um, I love your background too. I love what you are and how, how you deliver. Like you've got such a positive vibe, dude. Like um, you're, you've got the best teethy, toothy smile I've ever seen, the smile in, the smile in your eyes. And um, what's more importantly, listeners, is the care in your heart. And um, I really appreciate the time I've got to spend with you today and get to know how uh, accounting is not just accounting, it's something that's on the back end, the tax. 
Um, this is a, an amazing uh, conversation that I've had. I've, I've learned a lot spending time with you, Rakesh, and how you think. So thank you so much for jumping on Uncovered with me today. Thank you, Jason. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and your audience. I hope people can get some value from this. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. We really appreciate you and we really appreciate your time because time is so valuable. What we'd love you guys to do, if you like this podcast, if you could share it with your friends um, and also our website address for the podcast is www.wellnessbreakthroughacademypodcast.com. Our website is www.wellnessbreakthroughacademy.com. We have a free Facebook group called Wellness Leadership Evolution, so search for that. I'd love it if you could add me as a friend on Facebook. I don't buy it, so um, add me as a friend. And um, if you want some help and you would really like some support from us in the Academy, jump in. Um, we have a process. You can do a breaking call to connect in with us. We do small courses. Uh, we have lots of things that we share. So we'd love the opportunity to give you a chance to change your life and turn it into a free one. You are one transformation away from change. Come and catch up.